What's going on, my good people? It's Kilo. We back with another episode of the regular podcast on the regular network. Listen, man, this is going to be another quick one. You know, as you can see, things look a little bit different around me because I'm, I'm making changes. You know, I haven't finished making the changes yet. It's late. Excuse me if my voice is a little bit dry. It's, it's uh, 12, 18. That's very late for somebody like me. I'm super washed. I don't be up like that at, at, late at night. So look, <laughs> we're going to get right into it. Uh, did y'all hear about R. Kelly's sentencing? Of course y'all heard about it. R. Kelly was sentenced to 30 years in prison, federal prison for sex trafficking minors or sex trafficking and racketeering. And that that pretty much solidifies that he's cooked. He's done. He won't be, you know, he won't be able to weasel his way out of this one. And I'm not saying you know, that his childhood shouldn't have played a part in it, but normally his childhood shouldn't have played a part in helping him get a lower sentence. Excuse me. But normally, let's be real, when people get sentenced, it's very rarely that if they commit like a heinous crime like rape or molestation or murder or something like that, your backstory is not really going to help you a lot. You know what I'm saying? So we we pretty much knew, excuse me, a little fly. We pretty much knew R. Kelly was going to get cooked, all right? It was just a matter of how many decades they were going to give him. They gave him three decades, 30 years, and that's just half of what he's fighting. He also has to go back to Chicago and fight a federal case there on child pornography charges, all right? So it's, it's, it's looking like R. Kelly will never see freedom again. If he does, I don't, I don't know what, maybe some like mental health act can come out in like 10 or 15 years that goes back and retroactively gives people lower sentences or lighter sentences or lesser sentences due to severe trauma in their life. That's the only way I really see him, you know, getting out again. And you also, you always got to keep in mind that laws be changing over, laws change over time, right? So when I just, I just said the mental health act, like that sounds a little stupid right now, but it, that's a possibility. Like they come back Later on and say, hey, we got this wrong. Like these people would not have done this had it not been for this thing. And in lawyer word, they might say they might not have done this, but for the fact that he has been, he was molested as a kid, he might not have committed those crimes. So you never know. There might be a mental health act that comes out in five, 10 years and it revamps the whole prison system, lets a lot of people out. So we don't know. It's a possibility, you know, for R. Kelly. It's always R. Kelly, his whole situation is like polarizing because you have some people that like make it a point to let everybody know they're not going to stop listening to his music. It feels like you just want people to argue with you because you can completely listen to R. Kelly's music and just not say anything about it. It's not like you announce every single art. You don't announce every single artist that you listen to. So people announce the R. Kelly thing because they want to argue, right? That's it. If you want to listen to R. Kelly, keep on listening to him. It's not that big of a thing. You know what I'm saying? Before we go any further, real quick, I need y'all to subscribe to the channel. Trying to get the numbers up. You know, we got merch coming. Well, merch is already available on theregularnetwork.com slash shop. You can go over there, check the merch out. Also, check the other good shows on the network. We got, right now, I'm wearing my homie OG's clothing line right now. OG, you know. Y'all go check his stuff out too, man. I love the the like the tie dye look. So y'all let me know what y'all think about R. Kelly. Okay. Now the the main topic I really want to get into this week, and again this is going to be a brief podcast, but I think it's a very important topic, and it is it, it involves politics, and it's related to black people voting for Democrats faithfully. Now y'all let me know if you're a black person and you watch this show, or listen to this podcast. Have you ever voted independent or Republican? Or have you ever written a candidate in? Or have you voted Democrat every single time you voted? If you vote, you let me know. Honestly, I don't think I ever voted for a Republican candidate. Um, I've been voting since 2008, since 2008. So I'm 14 years into voting. I've been voting in primaries, general election, you know, midterms, local elections. And I don't think I ever voted Republican before. And 
I don't think that's because I don't agree with any Republican politicians. I think it's because of this blind loyalty that we as black people have to Democrats. Now, I'm saying we because I'm telling y'all I was doing it too. And I'm one of the people that a lot of folks might consider woke and critical thinker and all this type of stuff. And I was still going with the flow of feeling like if I vote Republican, I'll be disloyal to my my, my, my group. You understand? So a lot of people that I voted for in the Democratic Party, I didn't necessarily agree with, but I felt like I didn't want to be the one to mess up the collective effort of black people to vote for the same candidate. Now, a lot of times we talk about black people needing to vote in blocks and make sure that we put our power behind our vote and all vote for somebody we agree on. The problem is we have been voting for the same, you know, we all have been collective in our vote in voting in blocks and giving the major candidate the vote. The issue is we we haven't used it strategically to make them get things for us or get things done for us because we've, we've been blindly collective voting. And we've been doing this for Democrat. And I, I thought it was interesting that uh the loyal that the just how far our loyalty went when it came to this um Democrat voting thing. So what I did was what I did was I went and looked at all the elections starting from 1980, all, all the presidential elections starting from 1980 up until the most recent presidential election. And it's, it's kind of disgusting a little bit how high of a, of a percentage the Democrats have gotten of black votes versus how other races vote for presidential candidates. Almost all the other races, they're pretty much split, like almost half or it's either 60, 40 or something like that. It's very rare. Well, I haven't seen it since 1980 where another racial group in America or ethnic group in America votes at an 85% rate for one party. One can't, you know, the Democratic Party, anything like that. Let me just let me just run down some of these for y'all. Right. In 1980, uh, it was Jimmy Carter versus Ronald Reagan, right, in a presidential election. Black American, African Americans voted for Jimmy Carter, which is a Democratic person, at 83%. Versus 14% for Reagan. Now we get it, Reagan is not who we want to rock with as black people. We get it. I'm only pointing out the loyalty of Democrats, right? For white people, it was 30, it was 36 to 56, and then some people voted for Anderson, the independent or write-in candidate, right? And then Hispanic people, it was 56, 37. So it's, it's much more close to split. It's not a 80 plus percent thing. That's in 1980. Let's go to 84. 84, you had uh, Walter Mondale versus Ronald Reagan again. African Americans voted at 91% Democrat on that one. 91%. White people, 34% Democrat, 66% um, Republican. And then Hispanic people at 66% Democrat, 34% Republican. I have yet to ever see black people vote 34% Republican, not in my life. And I was born in 90. I haven't seen black people vote that way for Republican at all. If, if we did that, what the Hispanic group that did and voted 34% for Republican right now, they would tell us that we don't care about ourselves, that we are voting against our, our interests. They would say everything negative about black people in the books if we split our vote the way other groups do. When honestly, that's how you should be if you want to get things done. Let's go to 88. In 88, Dukakis versus George H.W. Bush. Black people, 89% for Dukakis, 11% for Bush. White people, 40% for Dukakis, 60% for Bush. Again, split. Hispanic, 70 for Dukakis, 30%. Even with Hispanic being 70%, it's still 30% went with Bush. H.W. Bush, right? That's Bush Sr. 92. In, in 1992, this is an interesting one for white people. 
Um, 92 African Americans, 83% for Clinton. This was Clinton versus H.W. Bush. African Americans, 83% for Clinton, 10% for Bush, right? At least we had 7% for the independent, which was Ross Perot at that time. 7%, that's pretty significant for uh, for an, a non-major party candidate. Um, white people in that same election, 39% Clinton, 41% for Bush, 21% for Perot. Could y'all imagine black people splitting our vote three ways that large of a chunk? 39, 41, 21? That's a big, that's a big split. Hispanic people, 61%. Clinton, 25% Bush, and 14% Perot. Asian people, so there wasn't that many Asian people in previous elections before 92 that were voting, so they didn't even have the numbers for Asian people on here. Asian people, 31% went with Clinton, 55% went with Bush, 15% went with Perot. Now, Asian people are a minority, considered a minority, and they, and they went over half for Bush. But again, if black people did that, y'all would lose your mind. Right? Let's do it. 96, Bill Clinton versus Bob Dole. You had um, you had black people vote for Clinton at 84%, uh, with Dole at 12%. White people went 44, 40, 44 with Clinton, 46% with Dole. Hispanic people, 73%. With Clinton, 21% with Dole. Asian people, 44% with Clinton, 48% with Dole. So that's, again, two the, the, the first two elections that Asians were counted significantly in, they picked a Republican both times more. Now, 2000, Al Gore versus George W. Bush, the son. You had black people at 90% for Al Gore and 9% for Bush. Hispanic people, 62% for Al Gore, 35% for Bush. White people, 42% for Gore, 55% for Bush. Asian people, 55% Gore, 41% Bush. So they now started to, they've been flipped over to the Democrat side. I don't know. This is the first major election I remember where they were in my, my school. I remember being in school and they were telling us, Gore is good, Bush is bad. I remember that vividly. I was in 2000, I was in Youngstown, Ohio. They were going hard about Gore, Al Gore. So I, that makes sense why 90% went with Gore and he still lost. 04, John Kerry versus George Bush. Again, they was going super hard to get black people on the John Kerry thing. Um, you, you had black people at 88% for Kerry, 11% for Bush. White people were at 41%. For Kerry, 58% for Bush. <clears throat> Hispanic people at 53%, Kerry, 44% Bush. Asian people, 56 Kerry, 43 Bush. D do you see how high of a percentage, though, that the other minorities other than black people are choosing Republican, though? 44% Hispanic went for Bush. 43% Asian went for Bush. Only 11% black people, though? It's, it's like we're all looking at, even though they try to group black and brown in the same category because we're not white, some of us are not white because a lot of those Hispanic people are white. That's why those numbers look like that. But they try to group us in a category statistically, but the people in the, in the groups, like black people, understand that we are not like Hispanic people in this country. Hispanic people understand they are not like black people in this country. So we are looking at it like, why do y'all keep grouping us together? We're not the same. Just because we're not white, some of us, it doesn't make us the same. Like, stop grouping us together. We don't vote the same. We don't do the same type of work. We don't have the same position in the country. We didn't get here the same way. We're not the same. Stop grouping us together. 2008, Barack Obama versus John McCain. Of course, black people, 95% Obama. Democrat, uh, we know that that was going to be high because we went we went all in on that one. White people went forty three percent Obama, fifty five percent McCain. Hispanic people went sixty seven percent Obama, thirty one percent McCain. Asian people went sixty two percent Obama, thirty five percent McCain. If if what I'm what I'm gathering from these numbers is that 
uh, people just have the party that they're riding with as far as the minorities, black people, Hispanic people, Asian people. The parties that we ride with, that's how we're going to vote. Because white people, it's kind of it's going back and forth between Democrat and Republican. You know what I'm saying? They 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 don't they're not only loyal to the party. They're, I don't know which way they're voting, but I know that there's this flip flopping. Okay, 2012 Obama versus Mitt Romney. Black people, 93 percent Obama, six percent Romney. White people, 39 percent Obama, 59 percent Romney. So they was trying to get Obama out of there. I wonder if this is one of the few times where uh, the candidate that the majority of white people chose didn't actually win the election because white people made up 72% of the voters that year on the presidential election. Hispanic people, 71% for Obama, 27% for Romney, and Asian people, 73% for Obama, 26% for Romney, right? 2016. You have African Americans for, this is Clinton versus Trump. African Americans voted for Clinton at 89% versus 8%. Hispanic people, 66% Clinton versus 28% Trump. You have Asian people, 65% Clinton, 27% Trump. Now look, Hispanic people voting 28% for Trump is just wild. And then I go to white people, 37% Clinton, 57% 57% Trump. It's wild, right? The Hispanic people would vote for Trump at that number, at that high, you know, a quarter of their voters voted for Trump because he was actively on his campaign trail talking about what a lot of people from Latin, Latin American countries were doing to America and how the rapists and the drug dealers and all that type of stuff was coming over here and messing America up. So the fact that he could speak like that about a group that you belong to and then you still vote for them at that rate is normal. It's only black people who don't do that. Okay? We're the only ones who don't do that. I can't say that they're wrong for doing that. They are doing what nor- what groups normally do. Is they vote a lot of them are voting their interests no matter what the candidate is saying that might be offensive in current culture. All right? 2020, you had Biden versus Trump. Uh, yep, B- Biden versus Trump. African Americans, 87% for Biden, 12% Trump. White people, 41% Biden, 58% Trump. Hispanic people, 65 Biden, 32 Trump. So during Trump's presidency, he doubled down and tripled down on how he felt about immigration and immigration and people not coming to this country illegally, mostly speaking about Latin American people. And he got a higher percentage of Hispanic voters in his second election. In twenty uh, in twenty twenty, he got more Hispanic. He got a higher share of Hispanic voters than he did the first time, and he was going crazy during his whole pregnancy. He was violating, talking crazy, all type of memes and gifs and, and sound bites that he was saying about immigrants, and he got a higher percentage of the vote. So it went from 28 per, Hispanic, it went from uh, 28% in 2016 up to 32% in 2020. For Asian people also, they voted at a higher rate for Trump the second time. After he talked crazy, even about when the coronavirus hit, he just kept on calling the China virus. And that didn't make Asian people vote for him any less. Actually made them go vote for him more. I don't know why. Uh in the 2016 election, Asian people voted for Trump at 27%. But in the 2020 election, they voted for Trump at 34%. So it's like, what's going on here? And that that's the end of um, talking about those numbers. But my point is, my, my point is that the blind loyalty on the part of black people to the Democratic Party is what's really killing us politically on the federal level. Because locally, the Democrats are more what we are looking for. They more align with our views. Normally, people that are close to us, they live around us most of the time. 
you know, when I say around us, I mean within 50 miles. They, they live in the same similar type of environment. They understand where we are in the state and they know what to do in the state. Federal politicians, though, they seem so out of touch. So when you vote for the party, it rarely ever pans out for anything for us black people because they don't really seem to value the vote because they feel like they're guaranteed to get it. They feel like they're guaranteed to get it, so they don't need to work for it. They don't need to give us anything. They know that if we vote another way, other black people will attack us. So they don't even have to attack us. When Biden said, if you don't know who you're voting for, then you're not black. He said that out loud, but that's how they all feel. They feel like they can, that's dog whistle to, the, to their minions. To say, if there's a black person questioning voting for a Democrat, attack them. Let them know that they are not good black people. Right? I'm, I'm bringing all this up to say, let's, let's start shaking this thing up, man. I say let's start shaking it up. If, if, we, if there's a candidate, if there's two candidates we don't like, like what's looking like it's about to happen right now, the next election, Trump versus Biden again, Excuse me, y'all. Lips a little bit dry. Listen, if, if, if we get the election that I think is about to come, I say black people, we just split that vote up, man. Don't, and, and the, the biggest issue that I see with this is that we feel if we don't like the Democratic candidate, that we shouldn't vote at all. We feel like it's Democrat or nothing. We, a lot of times, don't even look at what the Republican candidate is offering. We think Democrat or nothing, and it's mainly because the people trying to register us to vote all the time or the people talking to us about, hey, it's election day and all that, are Democrats. So we think, well, they're for us because they're the one that came out and told me to vote. But even if a Democratic candidate tells you to register to vote or tells you to go out and vote, it doesn't mean you owe them your vote. You don't say, oh, I don't like Clinton, so I'm just not going to vote at all. No. If you're a voter, you don't like Clinton, vote the other way if that person has what you want. Or vote independent. Get. I want us to get the votes on the board. Don't sit at home just because you don't like the Democratic candidate. That's what we do. We don't like the Democrat, not vote. Get the vote on the board. Even if it's like a throwaway vote, just, just put something other than, uh, check the box that's not Democrat just so it's counted as a vote. I need us to start doing that. We need the Democrats to feel heat that they might possibly not have our vote guaranteed. Actually, it shouldn't be guaranteed at all. They need to know for a fact that they don't have our vote locked up. All right? Because I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I stayed on there longer than I even wanted to. But just take, pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm telling you. Hey, we're going to switch, switch, make a hard left. Hey, did y'all hear that new Dirk? That new Dirk is kind of ain't. It's a, it's a deluxe, but he got some vintage drill stuff on there. And I, I think it's interesting. I don't think people talk about like Dirk's has been grinding for a long time, right? He came out around the same time Chief Keith came out or whatever. He, he got mainstream with his first little hit. But he didn't really blow up huge like he, like he is now until around like 2019. And what I think is, I think he blew up that way because of King Vaughn. And not to say King Vaughn got him lit, but King Vaughn made it so that Dirk was seen in a new light. Rappers always seem different now when they look like a boss now. Excuse me. When they look like a boss. So now if I'm starting to be, I look like a CEO and I'm putting other people on now and then somebody I put on blows up. Now I look totally different. So once King Von blows up, that doesn't put, that, that changes the category of artist that Dirk is now. Now he looks like a CEO artist. Now he looks like the guy that signs guys. So now he looks like a boss. 
instead of looking like, oh, that's Meek's little homie, or that's Future's little homie, or that's French Montana's little homie, or that's the dude that came in with Chief Keith. Now he's like, oh, he makes good music and he signed a star and put a star in place. I think that's what made him blow up, man. For real, y'all tell me what y'all think. Because it was just a few years ago when, when Dirk was doing joint projects with T Grizzly. And T Grizzly hasn't been like in the the hot topics for a long time, for a while, for some years now. And him and Dirk, they did multiple projects together. And then shortly after, Vaughn blows up. And now it's little baby joint projects. Now it's a whole different thing now. Now he's featured on every major artist, I mean, every major album that comes out now. Dirk has changed his whole life just by just, just by being seen as a boss. I respect it. All right, look, I'm not going to take up too much more of y'all time. I'm going to get out of here. I did want to say something real quick, though. I want to bring in a new segment, right? I know a lot of people, they feel like, oh, he's a know-it-all. He think he know everything and all that. So listen, you think that I'm a know-it-all. I'm trying to do a debate. I'm trying to do a little debate segment on my, on my podcast. I want the people who think that they are good at debating... I want you to come on the show with me. I'll give you five minutes. Whatever topic you want, you can pick a side. I'll choose the opposite side. I f- this is what I'm saying. If you stump me, I'll give you some free, the regular network merch. You get some free merch if you stump me. I don't really think y'all got it in you. I know people be saying, oh, you know, he think this, he think that. Okay, well, show me, man. We don't have to get disrespectful. We're going we gonna, to... Real topics. You pick the topic. Let me know what the topic is. Give me give me some time to look it up. But as soon as you give me the topic and I agree, we'll be on the next show and, we, and you'll get your five minutes. You'll get your five minutes. If you can stump me, if you can, if you can show me that you can debate, then yeah. I'll, I'll give you some free merch and I'll bow down. I'll say you got me. You that guy. You that female, you that lady, you know, I bow down. So I want to do that. You know, they, they, they say I'll debate everything, I'll debate anything. Well, look, put it to the test. Come, do, come, come argue with me. Hey, did, did y'all hear about this lady that they call a crypto queen? She is now on the FBI's top 10 most wanted criminals, most wanted fugitives list, right? So pretty much what this lady did, her name is Ruja Ignatova, Ignatova, Ruja Ignatova. I don't know how you pronounce that. I'm not sure. She's from Bulgaria, so her name is a little bit different than what I'm used to, okay? Pretty much she had a $4 billion, you know, pyramid scheme with this thing called OneCoin. She had people from all over the world buying this coin that really wasn't worth anything. They weren't even doing anything with it, but it, it was a, you know, she made it look good. She had a she had a big following. She made a bunch of people buy the stuff and it got her up to $4 billion. They said she had so much money, her and the people that she was conspiring with, they had so much money, they didn't, they didn't know what to do with it anymore. They started just like taking cash and just burying it putting it in suitcases, trying to fly it all over the world to different countries. and bury, they, So they've been burying money in different countries. They have they had a lot of bread. And, I mean, apparently she still has a lot of bread because she's on the run right now, man. But this is what I want to say about this. People hear stories like this and they think, see, crypto is a scam. But the problem is it's not crypto that's the scam. The scammers are scamming using crypto. It's, it's a different thing. Okay? So I want y'all to stop... You know what I'm saying? Just using this blanket thing like the currency itself is the scam. That just don't make sense. Okay. There are scammers and they will use everything to scam. It's like people sell houses that they don't own. That doesn't mean real estate is a scam. A scammer is scamming. That's that's what happens. We all should look this up though, man. This lady, you know, when you when you run up for uh and see, she started a company in 2014. So you run up four billion dollars in seven years, and you're you you know you scamming you scamming on another level. But the international criminals, man, them international criminals is, you know, 
they cold with it. I ain't gonna lie, cause people wanted people in jail because about the you know the twenty twenty thousand dollar PPP thing. That's that's chump change, you know. That's chump. even the people who they went to jail for the hundred thousand dollar PPP thing, man. That that's chump change. This lady is four billion up, and y'all ain't found her yet. Crazy. She got all them people money. But I really wanted to talk about the Big Ten. The Big Ten allowing um, a couple schools from the West Coast in. But I feel like I got to read more into it because I I, I want to watch the landscape and figure out what's going on because what I think, I think that that mega conferences are, are being built right now and it's, a, it's starting right now. The Big Ten allowed the UCLA and USC to join the conference starting in 2024. To me, this is going to create a mega conference, super conferences. And I think the other SEC and others will follow ACC. They'll follow by recruiting teams from all over the place. And I think it's mainly to squash the little guys. With this NIL thing going on, it's making it so that smaller schools are more competitive when it comes to getting recruits. Because the main difference between going to a small school and a large school previously was the resources. But now that I can use my own likeness and my following to get the same check no matter where I go. You know, I can go support the black school. I can go to the small school and play under Deion Sanders because all the celebrities support that and I want to be around the cool people and I want to learn the cool stuff. But when they create these mega conferences, the amount of money that those conferences will be able to get in sponsorships, going to play for an HBCU just won't compare. They, you won't be able to get that kind of money. They're, those schools are going to get billion-dollar deals. I mean, those those conferences will get billion-dollar deals and be able to distribute distribute that money amongst the, the highest-earning sports and athletes, which will mostly be football. You would kind of be crazy to go to one of these little schools and just for the culture type of thing. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's going to be the final nail in the coffin to some of these small schools. It'll it'll feel like, it'll 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 feel like you're dumb for going to a school where you where you might make a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand a year. When you got there will be kids at these bigger schools making a couple million a year, and you won't be able to compete. And they will have better facilities and better everything else. So it's you know I think I think this is going to be the the, the nail in the coffin for any chance that those small schools could catch back up by recruiting. You know, it's tough, man. It's tough. That's all I got for y'all today, man. I'm going to get up out of here. Make sure you subscribe. Like I said, if you want to debate, make sure you hit me up. I'll take on the other side. And if it's something egregious, then you got me. I'm not even going to debate it. You know, I'm not going to debate it. You got me. I'll just send you the free merch. But most things, though, yeah. You're going to get to it. Hit me up. Let's get interactive, man. Peace out.